great to see um, a good turnout uh, this afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. As as mentioned, I'm Tom Garand with the Kansas City Streetcar Authority, and uh, happy to be here today to talk about all things uh, streetcar. And so um, the agenda uh, for the meeting really, as mentioned, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and sort of do a high-level walkthrough of everything that we're doing, some of the, the challenges with the summer's repairs, but also current operations and, and expansion and what the future may hold. And we're going to provide a lot of time for questions. There's always a lot of discussion and questions at the end. So uh, please don't hesitate to use the chat uh, for, for any questions during the presentation. And we'll, we'll reserve ample time at the back end for, for conversations um, uh, and, and responses uh, in terms of where we're going. So um, first of all, um, we really need to start with our history. Uh, we are a city that's been built around transportation infrastructure from really literally Lewis and Clark to you think about um, the railroad uh, transcontinental railroad network and even three trails uh, connecting Kansas City to the rest of the country. Uh, the streetcar system of the early 1900s uh, that you see here over 300 miles of track uh, moved away from that in, in the mid 1900s uh, built out a, a really large uh, suburban highway system and are coming back now to the center of the region, uh, thinking about how transportation is integral in growing healthy, vibrant cities and, and regions and how we can use it uh, to think about what our future of our city and our region should look like. So uh, really the story for the modern day streetcar, it really starts uh, in the early 1900s with this large streetcar system that our city and many of our buildings were built around uh, that really formed the basis and the backbone of connectivity and growth and development for the for the early 1900s. And um, thinking about, again, uh, once we turned that off in 1957, uh, the impacts of, of really a suburbanization of our region uh, and the role of public transportation in our core and how we can better use it. So um, really after 1957, not long after, uh, we started uh, through a number of attempts to advance regional rail and light rail systems. And many of you probably know the name Clay Chastain of 10 propositions of voter approved initiatives or um, of citizens initiative petitions rather uh, to try to advance a higher quality uh, fixed rail system. Unfortunately, many of those plans were not feasible. And it really was the conclusion of, of um, some of those efforts though that were not successful uh, that sort of caused uh, folks in the region in 2010 timeframe to think about how do we start small and how do we start where we already have some general momentum in the downtown core connecting some of the initiatives that we're already moving forward and where we've seen strong support uh, for public transportation over the years through all of those failures. And so it was that learning of those failures that led us to a plan uh, that was crafted in 2010 and 2011 to build a 2.2 mile uh, streetcar starter line, uh, really the modern streetcar system in Kansas City, and it was very intentional at the time to be thinking to the future. This was, you know, we had an opportunity, many cities around the country were thinking about bringing back historic trolleys or streetcars. Um, St. Louis is one of those, but there are others. And uh, the leadership in, in Kansas City and the folks downtown uh, very much were intentional about not just recreating. We want to learn from the past, but we want to point to the future. And so let's think about a modern system that, that thinks about how we leverage technology and, and innovation uh, to bring really a transit option that, again, can, can sort of set the stage for broader growth and development and and really thinking ahead in terms of the long-term role transit can play in shaping our city. So uh, it was a $102 million project, uh, two, two route miles, you see the map here, connecting Union Station to the River Market. Uh, we started construction in 2014 and opened in 2016. So um, yeah, uh, hard to believe it's been eight years um, and time flies, uh, but we've, we've seen a great impact. Here's the aerial photo uh, for those not as familiar with the geography, uh, this downtown starter line was a connector. It was an overlay on a regional uh, transit system, wasn't designed to replace any routes or capability, but instead connect these districts downtown and connect regional transit routes that are coming into downtown to make circulation within our downtown core easier 
and again, connect and build on momentum that was already being created through the renovation and activation of Union Station and Crown Center, obviously the crossroads and the emergence of, you know, First Fridays and the art scenes and the vibrant nature of that as a neighborhood, the downtown loop, financial district, and then the river market. Prior to Streetcar, these four independent districts were each, um, you know, uniquely Kansas City in their own right, but they largely operated independent of one another. Uh, they were separated by one another from the terminal railroad tracks or interstate highways, and it impeded uh, induced demand and connectivity uh, between, across these areas. So the role of this project was a unifier and a connector. And we saw very early on after turning it on how it really helped to shape a redefinition for many people of our downtown, connecting these really authentic Kansas City destinations together uh, through the heart of our downtown um, for the benefit of people who work, live, and play here. So it's important uh, when we started this project to think about what's the goal? What's the purpose? What's the role of streetcar, of transit investments in general? At the beginning of every project, uh, you go through a process to evaluate what are the things we want to achieve? And that's really, really important uh, because uh, you don't jump to the solution. You start with what are the goals? What are our aspirations as a city, not from a transit perspective or from really a, you know, a, a quality of life perspective, a community development perspective, big picture. What's uh, what do we want to achieve and what's the role of public transit and, and investments uh, in helping us accomplish those those visions and those plans that we have for ourselves? So for us, it was really four goals. Um, that we established on the front end when we considered bus or streetcar and which street should it run on. And it was a connect, develop, thrive, and sustain were the four categories of goals. And so um, we used those to define the alternative, the streetcar on Main Street and the alignment. And ultimately we use those to evaluate our progress. And, and are, we, are we achieving the goals that we set out for ourselves um, with the initial project and, and is there more that we need to do uh, to try to maximize the benefits and really remind ourselves of the intention again around why we started with streetcar to begin with and how we concluded that that would be the right investment for the goals that we established so connect develop thrive and sustain and in each case um, we like to say we've you know kind of looked back we've exceeded expectations it's a great place to be we've always said there's no better case for expansion than a really strong start and so for us, tracking performance has been important. Over 12 million passenger trips. Um, who's riding the streetcar? Importantly, a third of all of our uh, trips on the on the weekdays are accessing employment. Uh, we've seen, you know, overall ridership, you know, grow year after year. And then po COVID hit, we saw a significant decline, like systems around the country did, like our highways and roadways did, frankly and have climbed back up to essentially pre-COVID levels again, and are one of the most productive streetcar systems in the country. So probably the most productive per mile of system, um, carrying over 5,000 people a day uh, on a short two mile route, quickly becoming the, the largest, uh, highest ridership route in the region um, on just a short route. So talk about um, Thrive, obviously residential density, downtown sales tax, all things that goals of the project, not just to connect assets, but to serve as a framework for reinvestment and regrowth and bringing people and jobs back down to, to the core of our city and the core of our region. And we've seen that uh, both economically and and obviously uh, from, a, from a development standpoint. And, you know, this is good for the city, uh, not just good for streetcar. And we can talk about why it's good for streetcar in terms of people riding it, obviously their productivity, the utilization of the system as a public asset, but um, it's reinvesting uh, resources into, you know, local businesses. Obviously people are spending money and that's good for the general sales tax collections for lots of other folks, whether it be public safety, uh, broader public transportation, uh, revenue streams or general general funds into, into, um, into City Hall. And then obviously we talked about the development, but, um, you know, we've seen significant growth of people and jobs, and and um, that's obviously having a positive impact on business. Um, and then public, you know, as we think about sustainability and sustaining a system, we look at that through, you know, financial, environmental, 
uh, and also public satisfaction lenses. And it really, public satisfaction is is really key. It's it's as we think about providing a public service, how are people viewing it? Are we adding value? And not just the real value uh, to the people that ride it, but what's the perception of the value to the people that don't ride it? Uh, because that speaks to, you know, our communication, the word of mouth, the reputation we're building, confidence we're trying to instill. And we've seen uh, really record levels of public satisfaction for transit. Um, and it's a really hard business to to keep people satisfied. One bad experience on, you know, a, a streetcar or a bus that doesn't show up on schedule. And if people, if those people have a choice, and in, in our case, downtown with a short route, people do have choices. They can walk, they can take other options, they can bike. And so uh, it's really important. It's it's a high bar to meet to give people a good experience every time, particularly regular users. But we, we strive to do that. And it's core to what we do, maximizing the value and the quality of our service each and every day. And um, one of the things that people, you know, really like about our system is that it's easy to use. Everything we've done from the fare policy to the alignment to the station stop infrastructure um, to to really even the vehicle graphics and and making some of that fun has been around attracting people uh, to downtown in the system and then making it very easy, intuitive for people to use. So uh, here's a few more stats on ridership, just looking at Again, over 5,000 average daily trips. Some days we're carrying over 10,000, over 15,000 during the NFL draft. We had days we were carrying over 20,000 trips um, on a small little streetcar system running two miles up and down. And obviously, as we grow the system, we add more cars, uh, we get bigger. Uh, those numbers will continue to grow. Um, I did want to you know, speak to, you know, obviously, one of the things we have to do um, Anytime you're 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 building a transit operation, is you have to operate and maintain it each and every day. So we like to talk about the big, exciting expansion things, and we'll talk about that as well, and what it took to do the downtown project and what the results are. Uh, there also is in the weeds day to day grinding of you know maintaining a high quality system and responding to unforeseen issues that might emerge for any variety of reasons. Um, and so over the summer, if you all were tracking, we had a, a track failure on our 670 bridge downtown um, that, that we didn't see coming and caused a suspension of service for uh, two and a half weeks uh, while we rebuilt some sections of rail over the bridge. Not this is not just the section that failed, but this but the adjacent sections uh, that we felt like could be susceptible to future failures. So here's just a timeline of, of the event, and then we'll talk more about sort of the some of the root causes and uh, what we're doing about it moving forward. So obviously it was July 4th, it was a holiday. You couldn't have picked a worse day uh, for, for you know, a bad thing to happen. In this business, you can't pick the day. And so operators um, and the team did exactly what we are trained to do and identified the issue, uh, responded to it with the service suspension and deploying a bus bridge uh, to start moving people downtown. We had a fireworks show. We had all sorts of things happening with the holiday. So uh, suspend the service, uh, protect the, the scene and ensure everybody has a, again, the immediate response is around, you know, passenger safety, infrastructure safety, um, no injuries involved, some inconvenience, but uh, the operators and the team did what we needed to do to identify the, um, the failure and then respond to it. And, uh, what we saw was a rail that was protruding, obviously, um, from the bridge deck that shouldn't be. And ultimately, the response to that was obviously coordinating with a number of partners. And I'll talk a little bit more about the process and, and some of the repair methodologies that go into this, um, why it happened, and, and again, what we're doing about it. So the um, the root cause was we, we had seen some deterioration on this bridge shortly after we opened uh, which was not normal. And so we saw a deterioration that was premature um, post initial construction of, of the rail on the bridge deck. And um, without getting too technical there, and I know this is sort of a technical session, uh, there's what's called a neutral rail temperature. So it's the, ultimately this rail is all welded into a big string. And as that rail gets cold, it shrinks. And as it gets hot, it, 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 as it gets hot, it expands. And there's design parameters around um, 
the temperature of that rail, the size of it, when you weld it together uh, to ensure that the, the their forces, uh, both hot and cold, can be absorbed. And so we had um, ultimately, uh, in layman's terms, we had probably a neutral rail temperature that was too low. And so it got hot, the rail expanded, it created too much pressure that, that caused deterioration in the pavement over time. And then we had a repair process. Uh, we had identified that early on and advanced proactive uh, repairs, but we had a material failure and some of the repair materials that were that were used. So it's a combination of um, expansion caused by heat and upward force, and then a failed product material that was used to to repair that. So there is more uh, around the, the design methodology for how the rail was originally placed and set. And as we rebuilt it, we uh, used a different approach. Um, there's no rubber boot. It's all fully encased and, and uh, directly anchored uh, to the bridge deck, which wasn't the case in the original design. And so um, here's the timeline of the, the repair and approach. Again, the rail buckle, um, coordinating immediately within 24 hours a repair strategy then two days of demolition of of four rail strings across the entirety of the six seven bridge deck um, and then resetting and installing those rewelding them and pouring approaches and then returning to service so the key thing here on the operations and maintenance side is obviously you you know we want to prevent this from ever happening again and causing a shutdown um, unanticipated. And so full inspection of the entirety of the alignment, changes in some of our installation practices. We're pushing the envelope on our system design. Uh, we know this, we're seeing, you know, as we talk about the resiliency of our infrastructure, um, you know, obviously temperatures are swinging. We're also carrying a lot of people and we have very heavy vehicles uh, with, with fewer axles than many other uh, larger vehicles. So we, we have, heavy loads. And again, all of those things sort of work against us as we think about uh, the integrity of our infrastructure. And so we already had um, considered changes in design be, uh, for Main Street and what we're doing on Riverfront based on even before the failure, before we started building Main Street extension a few years ago, we had seen the pre de uh, premature deterioration and modified uh, the, some of the design parameters. So thicker track slab, more fiber reinforcement, more um, more rebar reinforcement in the track slab, a different rail profile, actually. So all of these are lessons learned that were confirmed with the failure, but we've already integrated. So uh, coming back to the repair, obviously, um, the other thing that's really important from an operations and maintenance standpoint for us is that we have ready-to-go response teams and capacity um, to jump into action on short notice. So we can't anticipate all of the things that will happen, but we have to be in a position organizationally to respond to those. It could be, you know, a third party vehicle runs into one of our poles, or in this case, it was our own infrastructure that failed. Um, something gets struck by lightning, right? These things happen uh, running big systems uh, with assets in the street and the public right of way and having a team prepared and the capacity to respond quickly um, was one of the things that worked really well. So there's some things that didn't work well, obviously, with the failure itself, some of the material issues that we had, some of the things that worked well were having capacity, our contractual arrangements in place, and obviously the rapid response time, the bus bridging of services for people who still needed to move up and down Main Street during this entire period of time. Uh, those things all worked well. Um, but obviously, we, we don't want to ever be in that situation. And, and that's why the lessons learned being applied to uh, future projects is important. Um, just a little bit about the bus bridging. Obviously, you know, we're running service, we're running buses, we're putting operators on buses, we're, we're communicating the, at station stops. Obviously, we track ridership. And you can sort of see here um, a, a little bit about ridership, at, you know, pre and post repair. Uh, that just gives you a sense. We quickly rebounded um, once we reopened. Um, and while we're running bus ridership and bus service during the closure, we're not carrying nearly as many people. Uh, the level of service isn't quite as good in terms of the frequency. So that's a variable. And then it also just isn't as intuitive 
I think there's capacity constraints um, that we don't have on streetcar with bigger vehicles, with more capacity for wheelchairs and all of the all of the different user types. So it's an important necessary connection and service, but it's not it's it's not equivalent fully uh, to the streetcar service when we're in operation. So um, that's a good sort of segue to you know some of the lessons learned again already being applied to the Main Street extension and what we're building and where we're going from here. Um, so why extend the system? Let's start there first. We we started downtown. There was always a belief that we had an opportunity uh, and a need to do more uh, with capital investment and transit, high quality transit investment, high capacity transit investment in Kansas City. Um, we had really, uh, through our ATA partnership, through their work, started to demonstrate this in 2005 with the Main Street Max. And knew that the Main Street Max wasn't going to live forever. It had outlived its useful life. We had a need to look at the next generation of transit service on Main Street, and we had an opportunity to extend the benefits of, of the downtown streetcar on Main Street, really upgrading uh, the Main Street Max to the next generation of transit service for the Main Street corridor. And so we, you know, and in doing so, really developing the spine of a regional transit system system. Main Street had been central um, to the region's development um, in the cities uh, for sure throughout the years. That's the name, um, all, but also central to the to the transit system as a connector for routes from all over the region. Uh, also, it is it's principal to sort of this goal of how do we use transportation to bring people and jobs back? How do we connect our largest job centers together? How do we help to repopulate and regrow our city in a, in a healthy, vibrant, sustainable way? And how do we uh, continue to re-envision how transit a service can be an activator and a connector in, in a whole, at a whole different level than how we've used it uh, over the last number of decades? So um, what, we, what we know is that you know, again, the last streetcar service to run in Kansas City was the Country Club line from downtown to Waldo in 1957. And um, the opportunity to reconnect the two largest employment centers together through the densest neighborhood and the, 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 the largest university in UMKC together with a unified spine that will link all the way to the riverfront um, uh, down to UMKC is, is a generational opportunity, no doubt about it. It's connecting student housing, dense neighborhoods, obviously employment as we think about it. And and clearly, you know, it's not just a downtown thing anymore. It's elevating the presence of um, and the visibility and, and the function, frankly, of transit for, for all of Kansas City. And it becomes, um, again, a much bigger asset and it reinforces, you know, Kansas City in the core, right, as a place that we want people jobs and investments to be. And, and so um, we're making great progress on this project. We're now over 60% constructed um, with rail in the street. We apologize, but don't for the inconvenience. I always like to say, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry uh, for the inconvenience on Maine because it's the price of progress. It's We are building a 50 plus year asset in the heart of our city and some of the oldest streets and the oldest parts of town and it doesn't come without a little bit of pain and agony and in compromise we we've done great work our construction team and our communications team and communicating um, providing temporary access you know maintaining access i know we know it's an inconvenience we felt it when we went through the experience downtown but i can tell you um, not a day after we opened downtown, people had forgotten about the inconvenience and were excited for the benefits and what it would mean uh, to their access, to their business, to their neighborhood. And so we're um, the lights at the end of the tunnel. Uh, within about a year, we're going to be almost out of the street and out of Main Street with most of our construction being done by the end of next calendar year. And then we'll transition into testing of systems and training of new operators and staff um, thereafter with an opening in 2025. So um, feels like it's been a long time and it has, uh, but it's because what we're doing is, is literally foundational, uh, much of it under the street with upgrading utilities and base, basic core infrastructure 
but also obviously all of the improvements and the coordination that has to happen on the surface and on the street and with all of the infrastructure uh, in a coordinated fashion. So um, some pictures of, of where we are with schedule, some of the things you see that are very obvious um, in terms of you know the track and the ground, but there's a lot of other work. We have facility work happening here. Um, you might hear some of it out, out of right outside my window uh, with a new warehouse, with expansion of, of our maintenance facility. You know, again, it's not just op building the infrastructure, it's preparing to operate and maintain it at a high level. And it's not just six streetcars, it's going to be a total of 14 streetcars. We're going to have eight more. So we have to have a place to store them and maintain them. And uh, we're excited to welcome actually our first of those streetcars into Kansas City, likely in January, in just a few weeks. So um, it's starting to feel very real in terms of the back end of this process. Um, here's a few pictures of track um, being constructed. I, I really like these pictures by uh, World War One Museum and Memorial because um, I did a I did a route walk uh, looking at construction and talking to some of the construction folks and uh, early on and we were in the middle of of removing the old streetcar rail. You saw the map that I shared of 300 miles of system. Some of that system obviously was right here on Main Street and actually we had multiple generations of rail in the street on top of each other. So they just literally built. Um, you know, different generations of, of old streetcar on top of earlier earlier generations and, you know, started even in the late to 1800s with horse-drawn uh, streetcars. And so horse cars, actually, uh, they were called. So it's um, been fascinating to see uh, the transition and really is impactful and symbolic. And as you think about that investment, that was 100, you know, 100 years old in the street served to connect our city together, and we have construction crews out there putting new rail in the ground for the next generation. It really is a sort of brings home the significance of, of what we're doing with this infrastructure and, and uh, again, um, sort of reimagining some of our history uh, through, a, through a modern, um, you know, application and uh, for all the same reasons and benefits. Here's a few pictures um, looking up. It looks like we have 45th Street by uh, American Century here with the set with the uh, southbound track making great progress to that hill at 45th Street and then the crews will flip over to the north side and, and tackle the northbound um, the stuff really from Pershing to 31st is looking more and more finished if you were to go to the northern end of our Main Street extension and again this is three and a half miles in total um, you'll see you know, streetcar completed on both sides. You'll see curb infrastructure and new new bump outs, landscaped areas that are being constructed, um, new power poles being installed, all of those things um, starting to starting to look a little bit more finished. Uh, a few renderings. So here's a, a picture of what the streetcar station will look like at UMKC. Um, this is sort of, you know, it looks different, a similar, but different than what you see downtown. And this is to really represent the change in function that we have, you know, we're going from a downtown circulator to the spine of a regional system. And so we're gonna have major destinations in the plaza and UMKC, and we need more passenger waiting area. We need more amenities. We, we have to have the capacity to service a greater number of people, and we need more operational redundancy. So it's a two double-sided platform instead of a single-sided platform. So um, some of the change in function as we start to grow the system beyond downtown that uh, will be well received. I mentioned earlier the maintenance facility, the work that's required um, behind the scenes. I always, I'd like to tell the story of, you know, when we first opened the system in 2016, we had to decide what to put on the shelf. Our streetcars have parts from 160 sub suppliers. About 80 of those are domestic uh, U.S. manufacturers. About 80 of them are international. And so how many of those parts on those cars do we need on the shelves? What's the lead time, the inventory, the logistics, and thinking through how long will they last, right? Um, we don't want a car sitting out of service because we're missing one part, um, and we can only get that part from Austria, and it takes eight months to get it. So these are uh, the things that a new system with no operating history has to try to manage. And I think we've successfully 
sort of got over the first hurdle with the downtown operation. We built a track record um, and, and a knowledge base. And now we're growing the fleet with the same vehicles. And that will help us, frankly, with redundancy uh, from an operation standpoint. So here's a few more pictures of things happening with the parts warehouse, uh, with some of the civil work. And then on the right is our new Bay 4, and it's a double length bay. Uh, that big blue machine is a wheel truing machine. So just like your your uh, rubber tires get flats, our steel wheels on the streetcars actually get flats and they need to be rounded out every once in a while. So in the past, we've had to pull those wheels off the cars and do that maintenance. Uh, this new machine will allow us to drive right over a machine and do it in, in a much more economical um, way from a from a cost and time standpoint, uh, which will be great. And then we have maintenance inspection. And then in the way back, there's a long-term uh, repair position there for us. Uh, if we have a car that needs work, that, that's a longer period of time. So talked a little bit about the future of the fleet. We'll be growing the fleet from six to 14 vehicles. Uh, we are using the same CAF Urbos 3 vehicles that we're operating downtown, but we are integrating upgrades. So you might imagine technology from 10 years ago has changed. We're going to have new passenger information systems. So the signs inside uh, that will have more capability. We're going to have a new camera system with, with better camera coverage and, and feeds um, covering the interior and exterior of the, the vehicles. And then um, a driver alert system, so we call it an automatic driver detection system, an ADAS system, like you would have in your car with sensors that that help to, you know, let you know if you go over the line or that you need to brake. Um, we'll be testing out some of that new technology on the new fleet um, early next year, and we're excited about bringing some of that to streetcar um, for for our benefit. The um, here's a picture of of the first a new car uh, in the pipeline. Maybe this isn't the first, actually, um, but it's it's one of the eight under production. Uh, you see the car on the left hand side that is likely the first. So we're we're right now 801 through 806. And so we'll be growing up to um, um, 814. So um, the history around the 800 series, just for what it's worth, when we turned the system off in, in 1956, we were on the 700 series of streetcar. And when we reopened in 2016, we decided to pick up on the on the con naming convention of the vehicles uh, for the 800 series. So that's, that's how we ended up with 800 uh, series vehicle and, and names. So uh, the other thing we're currently looking at on Main Street is the opportunity for exclusive lanes. So the, the city council has passed a resolution really uh, directing us to look at the opportunity to convert some of the transit lanes um, and streetcar lanes that were planned to be mixed traffic for those to be exclusive transit only lanes. And so we are doing that work right now. We're excited about the opportunities. We really think it could be a win-win uh, to make uh, greater benefit of the streetcar system we're building with really minimal impacts. Um, we have sufficient auto capacity, we believe. Uh, we won't be restricting access to businesses or driveways. And um, but we have more work to do there, uh, but we're excited about the opportunities. And here's just a few of the treatments used in other places uh, that that help to designate and, and really define uh, transit-only operations and some of the things we might be considering in certain aspects of Main Street. I will say the original Main Street design had about 30% of the route as full as dedicated transit already. So there was already uh, significant segments that were planned for transit only or exclusive transit use, uh, but we're now looking at other segments as well and the opportunities. And here's just a picture of a subsection of, this is uh, between Warwick and 30th Street for reference for people who know. Right now that was a six lane street uh, where the current original streetcar design was to move that to four lanes with center turn lanes. And here you see um, with the blue outside transit only opportunity, what that might look like. Uh, pink is um, on street parking. Green is vegetated uh, bump out, new landscaping areas, and obviously new medians also as part of that and, and new station stop infrastructure. So really a, a substantial transformation of uh, with or without the exclusive lanes. If you take the blue lanes, the blue lines or lanes off of this, um, the basic infrastructure in terms of narrowing the, the street, the curb lines, 
the bump outs for pedestrian crossings, improving pedestrian access, the stations being pushed out into the streets. So the stations you see are um, not like the max stations that were on the sidewalk. These are really uh, consuming that what was an outer travel lane of Main Street that's reducing the width and giving us more pedestrian space for the platforms, which is what we did downtown. Uh, so that's really looking south. That's three and a half miles of $352 million. I should have led with that. And that's a half paid for by federal funds that we've secured and half paid for by uh, ratepayers in the transportation development district. So if any of you are within the existing Main Street TDD, um, thank you. Uh, your contribution to um, um, the TDD and what the TDD is allowing us to do is making this possible. It's allowed us to leverage new federal money, um, which really ultimately uh, represents the largest federal investment in public transit in our region's history. And so significant investment of new money, local money, leveraging new federal money. And this is how big projects get done around the country. Moving north to the riverfront, um, again, this has been a district that's made tremendous progress over the last decade. Um, when we started the conversation around a streetcar opportunity and connection, in really 2016, there wasn't a single building on uh, Berkeley Riverfront. Port had done amazing work with the park. Um, they had started to, to get some interest in development opportunities. Nothing had, had taken hold. And one of the reasons is it really literally is on an island. It's separated from downtown by um, a bridge in the Grand Viaduct that has no accommodations, no bicycle, pedestrian, no ADA accommodations. Um, really uh, necessitates and almost requires a vehicle access. And so, and I can't tell you how many people on streetcar tours, we, we get to the river market and they say, this is the river market. How do we get to riverfront? How do we get to the actual river? And there is a um, town of Kansas pedestrian bridge, if you're familiar with that, which is an amenity and it's a great connection. But in terms of direct intuitive access, it's not obvious to many people. So we started the planning in 2016 around a streetcar connection to, again, just like we did downtown with the interstates, bridge the divide of the railroad tracks, of the connectivity challenges, and reconnect our river. Um, many folks view this as just benefiting you know, new developments on the riverfront. And I can tell you that's part of the plan is to help you know, incent and, in, and induce projects like the Casey Current Stadium, which wouldn't be where they are if it wasn't for a plan to provide multimodal connectivity. The other part though, is the story is connecting the rest of our city and everybody on the streetcar route to the riverfront as an amenity. As we think about building a high quality place to live, work and play, connecting ourselves back to the river we've turned our backs on for so many years, we feel like is, is fundamentally a huge opportunity. And again, working with the port, and others to leverage transportation connectivity to make that obvious intuitive and intuitive and easy to get to uh, will be a tremendous opportunity. We think this will be just like the Southern end, this will be a postcard for Kansas city uh, when we're all said and done. And here's obviously the CPKC stadium that's, that's going to be operational in 2024. 20, uh, we hope, uh, we're running through the back end of our procurement process and our hope uh, we hope to be under contract on the streetcar extension by the end of this calendar year and the clock is ticking. Um, so that is that is moving forward. And then we're starting the process. So those are funded projects, Main Street and Riverfront. And the vision is to grow our spine from two miles to six and a half miles between now and 2020 for the end of 2025 and we're well underway. And so the region now needs to be thinking about what's next. Um, the system is an evolution of investments over time. And if we aren't now thinking about what's next in, as it relates to the region's plan, then we're gonna be behind the curve. Uh, systems and regions around the country who are doing this really well have a pipeline of projects that are ready to go. There's a federal infrastructure opportunity, a bill passes, and that you've done the hard work. Well, in Kansas City, we haven't done the hard work. And that's what we're attempting to rectify uh, by continuing to advance the projects we have, but also 
getting ready pro other projects and other opportunities that can put us in a position to take the next step. Uh, we know, you know, Main Street isn't the only need in town. And we also know that um, we need to look east-west. We need to look to other parts of the city and we have to be thinking more uh, systemically about how we grow the system and extend the benefits for all of Kansas City. And it's not just through the lens of streetcar, mind you, it really is multimodal streetcar is not the right solution or mode for every transit problem. And so it's really a partnership. And in this case, we're working with the uh, KCHCA and Ride KC on an east-west high capacity study. That study has recently indicated the preferred mode is streetcar in this corridor east-west, which provide a great unifier and connector and extender again of the system, as well as linking the key north-south routes on Troost and Prospect and other corridors, as well as connecting uh, conceivably KU Mid Center and the Kansas side for a bi-state uh, connectivity and benefit. So that effort is ongoing, just had a big public meeting and there is a survey. I see that you see the link there, would encourage you to uh, provide comments on that survey if you have them. I'm gonna keep moving because I wanna retain some time for questions and I'm just about done. And again, all of this feeds into a plan for uh, the region's future uh, and what the role of transit can and should be, and how do we do the hard work to build consensus around our priorities, uh, the due diligence that's required to be competitive for new federal money, and ensure it's not other regions uh, that are making improvements in their systems at our expense or at, at our missed opportunity, but it's Kansas City and it's our region uh, that's continuing to progress. And so here's just a list of, and sort of a map that shows, you know, what we're doing on Main Street with Riverfront, how it relates to the Bi-State Sustainable Corridors Project on Independence Avenue and State Avenue, work in conversations that are happening north of the river, or east-west, and then obviously future opportunities that aren't even on this map uh, that, we're, that we're also tracking and interested in, in advancing and getting ready to, to move forward. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop the share and kick it back to Eric and uh, be happy to jump into questions. All right, yeah, uh, thank you, Tom. And if you have questions for Tom, uh, you'll see a Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. Just type your questions in there. You can also go to the chat box on the on the right side of your screen. And we, we've got a couple of questions in there already. Before we begin q and I just wanna, I, I put this in chat earlier, but I just wanna let people know that the Kansas City Public Library has reprinted their streetcar history tour map. So visit a branch to pick up your copy. All right, let's go to go to some questions uh, related to rolling stock. What is the timeline from ordering to receipt? So How long is that process? Yeah, so typically you're looking at right now um, 36 months from order to delivery. Is really um, is really sort of an industry standard. It's grown from two years to, to closer to three years as there's been more kind of competition, there's more investment, more federal regulation in truth and more challenges with supply chain. So it's a big risk on these projects, the vehicle delivery, lots of things typically pivot, you know, in terms of the critical path on the vehicles. And that's our, that's, that's for us. We got out early. Um, we kind of knew the vehicle. We liked our downtown vehicle. We didn't want to introduce a second vehicle manufacturer, which is a whole second set of inventory parts to manage and different processes for maintenance. So we, you know, it's easier to extend the fleet than to just start new, of course. Uh, but we're looking at about three years from initial order to delivery present. All right. Uh, next question. Where do you find construction and track maintenance staff with the necessary skills? Great question. So um, operations and maintenance obviously are a little bit different. We have um, an amazing diverse background of, of, of professionals working on our team. And so I can tell you on the operator side, we have a number of folks who, who were bus drivers uh, previously that came over, but we also have attorneys. Uh, we have folks who, um, who uh, drew, drove, com you know, were commercial truck drivers, a whole host of backgrounds, educators, so a whole host of backgrounds, uh, really, um, particularly on the operator side, obviously, um, but it really in both, 
uh, we have a really extensive on-the-job training program where we bring people in that ha that have right the aptitude and interest, and then we train them uh, to do what they need to do on streetcar. It's very unique to our operation, you know, our standard operating procedures and yeah. processes. On the maintenance side, we um, also we you know we see some mechanics, um, automotive. Um, but but a very wide range of expertise. We obviously deal a lot with um, electrical work. All of our workforce is is, is uh, unionized under IBW Local 53, and and part of that is stems from everything that we're doing is electrically powered, from our overhead power lines on our main line to obviously our vehicles themselves, and then obviously we also have significant. Um, as you think about computer technology, these cars are really sophisticated. And so we have folks who also have backgrounds and, you know, managing systems, uh, digital systems and computer systems that, that are necessary to drive the vehicles themselves. Yeah. But it's just like everywhere, finding maintenance staff, um, you know, to do the work that needs to be done, cleaning our platforms, maintaining the track, maintaining the cars is a, it's a tough, it's a tough road right now. It's, um, we're we're you know growing our staff from 45 to almost 100 people over the next 24 months to be able to operate and maintain the big system that we're building and and again we've got a big hill to climb on hiring and there's a strong push to do that right now so if anybody's out there um, and you're interested in career opportunities check our website out kcstreetcar.org we've got an employment page we're hiring and we'd love to have you come join us. All right, the same person, Al, uh, has a second question. Uh, do any of our hills offer traction difficulties with steel on steel load bearing surfaces? So the question is about grades and the steepness of grades. So I would say this is maybe my greatest, um, you know, nervousness of everything that we're doing with expansion. We've got a lot of smart people. Um, the vehicles are rated for obviously grades. Um, that um, that are less than what we'll be running on. Our system's all been designed to accommodate the grades. They do provide a lot of um, and, uh, stress on the system. So really actually more than traction, it's braking um, because of obviously the, the, the significant grades in both directions. So all I can say is our specifications on all of our systems, vehicles included, have capability to operate in this environment. We've verified that through a number of sources. That will be something we'll be testing, right, in all conditions early on after we uh, get construction complete to ensure we're seeing performance that's consistent with what the design specifications indicated we would see. That'll be that'll be paramount. All right, we have a question about parking at UMKC. I have actually a couple of questions. Are there are are there plans whether it's casey streetcar or plans that you know of uh, at umkc for increased parking at the southernmost yeah. end of the, of the expansion project yeah we've had a great conversation so first of all we're building a parking facility at um, cleaver and maine right by our plaza stop which is where we we anticipate uh, from our modeling most of the demand will exist um, umkc however uh, we have a uh, active conversation right now with the university. There's been strong support and partnership for a shared parking arrangement for that location. You may be aware there's an Oaks Place parking garage there now um, that um, relates to a redevelopment concept that they're currently contemplating was connected to residential buildings that are no longer present, but the garage is still there. So we have an arrangement um, generally agreed to for up to 156 spaces of available parking in that existing facility um, um, through just a partnership arrangement. And obviously, as they're going through redevelopment efforts over time, I will continue to be engaged and in, in thinking about how we're connected. But it just so happens we've got a parking garage built literally almost right across our platform uh, from where our terminus and right now it's not being uh, fully utilized. They actually just reopened it to temporary uh, to, to to temporary use, uh, but we'll have again, and we anticipate a near term opportunity there uh, for leveraging that capacity for for our benefit. All right, we have a comment from David. Uh, he writes, uh, "The maze that the long planning required for these projects 
Hats off to those involved in getting the system started and still planning for more. It's uh, the time frame of these things. Typically, I think downtown, I was leading the planning at Mid-America Regional Council in 2010 and 2011, and we opened in 2016. That was about record pace uh, for these projects. The Main Street, we really, after we opened downtown, we started planning in 2017, um, really formally, and we'll be opening in 2025. So that's about an eight year time frame. That's moving pretty quickly. And it is it is a long road, and it's one of the reasons why we've struggled as a city and a, as a region um, to to be effective in this space because we haven't had the staying power to build a vision and consensus and plan, and then move move it forward. What often oftentimes is over multiple you know um, administrations, whether it be mayor or city managers. So having a vision, having a plan, having organizational horsepower uh, leadership around driving a vision forward over a long period of time is fundamentally necessary. And it's why we're trying now to build a pipeline of projects for the next things, uh, for the next set of investments. So that, you know, if I'm not here, if one other person isn't here, we've got other people, we've got an agreed upon plan and vision and, and a track record and organizational infrastructure to keep these things moving. Um, as you know, we have a revolving door at, at obviously, and and um, just by the nature of term limits and, and things of that nature, um, in local leadership. All right, and uh, Donna has posted in in the chat the link to Casey Streetcar's employment page. It's Casey Streetcar dot org backslash home backslash employment. So check the link there in chat if you're interested in working for KC Streetcar. Uh, what are some of the great examples of technology and innovation that are being used on the current streetcar? Well, one of the things we don't talk about much is the vehicles themselves are what we would call 100% low floor. So if you were to get on a streetcar, there's no steps. Um, that's not normal in most transit operations, whether it be a bus or even most rail passenger rail operations, around the country, you step in the middle at a lower elevation and you have to climb up steps on the end to get over um, uh, what really is axles, wheel axles. In our case, we have a modern truck design that allows for a fully 100% low floor platform. And what does that mean? It means you know wheelchairs, uh, bikes, strollers, uh, scooters, all of the things, all of the wheel devices that can come on a car or just somebody with a, a, a mobility impairment has access to the entirety of the vehicle. And um, that um, we knew that was gonna be valuable. We underestimated how valuable that would be um, until we opened the system and saw the power of the accessibility of what it means to somebody to be able to roll on in a wheelchair, uh, have ample room for multiple individuals, not have to stop the service for a long period of time to tie, tie, tie chairs down, um, with straps or, or other devices, but fully accessible, just like every other um, sure. you know, able-bodied person. So that's a huge component of this. Um, clearly, the vehicles are larger. You have four doors on each side, which is unique. Um, that I think the station stop infrastructure we're modernizing and some of the new things we're doing with lighting and camera and, and security features. So, and again, a lot of what's happening is happening under the roadbed that that maybe isn't obvious. The mix of concretes that we're using, um, the, what we've learned in terms of you know handling, you know vibration and and um, response obviously to, to incidents. So uh, those are a few of the things that come to mind. All right. Will the East West study estimate the economic development potential? Is that part of it's sure. not it's not just building the yeah line, absolutely the so water. again the the clear the the preference from the community and we engaged over two thousand individuals in our last round of of public meetings on what the vision for East West Transit should be and largely it's centered over two thousand seventy over seventy percent of the folks said we want streetcar extended east because we see the power in the, of the connectivity. And so one of the parallel conversations that has to happen, and it's happened on mid, mid, in Midtown and it's happened downtown, is what does that mean from a local policy standpoint, from a from a land use planning standpoint? How do we 
um, how do we plan for you know an investment such as this in a way that really reinforces the goals of the community? And I think there was another question about gentrification. Absolutely, yeah. that's top of mind. Um, we're having conversations downtown and in midtown, right? You know, when we started this, the whole goal was to get people in jobs here and to make downtown a destination, right? We're seeing obviously that interest, that demand. It's great. It also is, and not just downtown, across the region, across the country, we're seeing these escalations and in, in valuations. So how are we managing those so we're not displacing folks, so we're reinforcing the goals of, that the community has for itself? As I said from the beginning around the purpose and need and that being really important, this has never been about streetcars, never about the shiny streetcars. It's always been about what do you know? What do we want for the future of Kansas City? What's our vision for Kansas City in 2050? And what's when the same questions are being asked on the east side as we think about in the west side as we think about streetcars? What's the vision we have for ourselves? And what role does transit and in this case streetcar play in helping to bring that to life? And and to the degree there's um, growing pains or un unintended consequences, we're learning about these things. How do we manage those things effectively? Uh, with local policy, you know, working with the city and, and others who, who really have a purview uh, on many of those policy and planning um, issues. Um, but yeah, absolutely, it's top of mind. It's going to be integral to our planning as we take the next steps on the East West Street car in particular. Sure. Um, question from Robert. The Kansas City Area Transportation Authority is, is contemplating resumption of possible bus fares. Do you foresee the streetcar uh, having a similar process or will it remain free? Yeah, so I'm going to take that. I'm, I also see another question about ATA, and so I want to start there. Um, the KCATA has been an integral partner in uh, these um, projects from the very beginning. They're a core partner in the project. And, and at the end of the day, we're one route in the regional system. And it's important everything that we do be customer um you know, and rider focus to make sure that, you know, whoever is operating and helping to manage the systems um, behind the scenes isn't impeding building an intuitive, high quality, easy to use regional transit system. So they've been integral when we started this process in really 2012 and, and the governance conversation, we had no rail capacity in the region. We also had a downtown um, TDD that was paying for nearly all of the, the local costs on the project. And so there was a strong um, consideration that, you know what, we need to have a mechanism from a governance standpoint that gives the folks that are paying the taxes on an annual basis an ability to influence and drive policy decisions like FAIR, like marketing and branding, like the service hours, like and, and create ownership um, amongst the, the structure. So, Part of it was the funding and financing mechanism that drove a structural approach. The other part of it was we didn't have capacity in the region. Nobody was in a position to do this uh, day one. And so uh, ATA continues to be integral in everything we do and they're at the table. Uh, I think that will continue as we move forward. And because of the funding and financing um, nuance that we're funded through a dedicated tax for a streetcar, uh, we, we believe on the streetcar side, we don't foresee any uh, there's no intention and no plan, and we don't think uh, likely any uh, need for uh, imposing a fare on the streetcar service. And and the primary reason for that is we, we did the analysis early on, and because we're collecting a sales tax and special assessment from property along the alignment, um, the more people we can get to use the system, we can maximize the utility of it, the more folks will support local business up and down Main Street. And we, I like to say we collect a fare, but it's an indirect fare on the economic transaction, on the sales tax, uh, that uh, you know the money that people spend. And so the more people, um, the more money that gets spent, the better for local business. And we're actually collectively, um, you know, indirectly collecting a fare on that economic transaction in a way that creates this symbiotic relationship between pushing people to the service maximizing the benefit of it, supporting local business, and then capturing a little bit of that on the on the sales tax side to support operations and maintenance. And the other thing that it allows us to do is to forego um, the costs of the equipment and the fair enforcement, which 
Uh, we've we've done some early testing. We've seen other systems. We think the fair to no fair decision is about a 30% swing in ridership. So for us, again, as we economically forecast the cost benefits of collecting a fare, depressing ridership, depressing economic impact, right? We actually feel like we're netting a positive return by eliminating the fare, pushing people to the service, letting them support local business, and then collecting the sales tax on the back end, absent those things. And again, the net result of all of that is the system's easier to use, right? Visitors, people coming in from out of town don't have to worry about, um, you know, the intimidation factor, which is very real, by the way, on public transit systems, that people feel like it's not approachable because I don't know exactly how to do it and I don't want to ask because I'm, you know, people are out of town and they have choices and, you know, they're going to walk five blocks or they're going to hop on a streetcar that just happens to be passing by. Um, and, and you've got people... Yeah. He's got people behind you waiting to get on. Yep, and... Exactly. So it's it's lowering the burden. So for us, long answer to the question, but it's sort of complicated. Uh, but we don't foresee uh, reintroducing a fare on streetcar anytime soon. Okay, great. Uh, we're a little past the top of the hour. So I know we got a few questions out there. But, I'm happy to stick uh, around for a few minutes. Okay. Um, you mentioned a, a large amount of federal funds. W were more funds made available after the Infrastructure Act that was passed? by U.S. Congress last year? No, uh, well, more more funds were funneled into the formula. We actually secured our largest uh, of our federal grants through the prior administration, uh, believe it or not, however you lean. Uh, and we did receive some COVID relief um, money through American Recovery Act, which was separate from the Infrastructure Act, um, to, to help to address inflated costs that we were projects around the country were seeing um, due to supply chain challenges. But... Um, the funding programs that we've tapped into are reoccurring annual programs. They're just programs that the region as a whole hasn't tapped into historically. And in fact, I, I, I like to say it, it makes some people uncomfortable, um, but our Main Street extension was the first time since the mid 90s that the state of Missouri had received a grant under the New Starts uh, FTA program, which is the largest national discretionary transportation program in in USDOT on an annual basis, one it's wow. one and a half to two and a half billion dollars. Um, the state of Missouri has been on the sidelines for that largest program in the country for 20 years or more, and until uh, Main Street extension, um, and that's because we brought new local money to leverage new federal. All right, a question from Stephen. Is there any idea to incorporate retrofitted, either legacy, historical, or replica rolling stock, or is there a complexity with the track that prevents that? It um, There's no plans to advance. There are other systems that would be cool and fun, um, but it's really costly. Our system is a little bit more challenged than most because we require a double-ended streetcar. So a lot of the old streetcars are single-ended. They used to run in loops or have turnarounds, like down in Waldo. They have the old turnaround for the streetcar, so they weren't double-ended vehicles like ours have, like our system is designed now. So, unless there was a really large donor willing to mm -hmm. um, invest uh, private money in a in a restoration that was compatible, I don't foresee it being something. It'd be great. It'd be a lot of fun as a as a charter sort of thing. Uh, but there's a lot of challenges, cost and ADA accommodations, other other requirements that would go into making that uh, viable. And if you would like to donate for that, visit uh, kcstreetcar.org, yeah, right? And, yep. <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's end with this question from Kyle. Besides writing, how can residents continue to encourage more extensions and growth as quickly as possible? Well, I think um, the biggest thing is to communicate to your council representatives, engage in our process. We're going to be having more public engagements on these things in the very near future. But let your uh, let your um, council members know how you feel. I think there still is a perception, we as painful as it is, that you know from some folks that you know they I don't want to say they're in denial, but from their perspective, they don't see the value in what we've done for downtown and. I live this every day and that's hard for me to believe is true, but it is true. And, and either people don't come down or they don't, we have short memories, right? We forget what downtown Kansas city looked like 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, the same will be true for midtown in 10 years, right? We're going to look back and forget 
um, you know, the vacant parcels, the empty buildings, the, the you know, the, the surface parking lots uh, that exist today that are no longer there in 10 years. And um, we have to remind ourselves of that. And again, we have to do some of the hard work to invest in the due diligence. We spent $5 million of local funds, put together a partnership to get Main Street extension to the point of being eligible for a federal grant. And that takes um, leadership, it takes support um, from folks, and a belief that there's a long-term value and continue to, to row this boat uh, in this direction. So I think uh, participate in our process and, and, and reach out to your council members uh, and encourage uh, continued movement progress. And keep riding the streetcar. That's right. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, I learned a lot. I know that. And we'll have to make this a regular thing to get some yeah. updates. It, it's interesting. Thanks for having me. I know there's always the a lot of questions, so happy to do it. All right. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's program. For more information on upcoming events at the Linda Hall Library, visit lindahall.org. For upcoming programs at the Kansas City Public Library, visit kclibrary.org. When visiting our websites, I hope that you also take the opportunity to support both libraries through our foundations. Your contributions help make all of our programs possible and freely available. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.